Back to My Garden, Episode 92. Welcome to Back to My Garden. Discover your passion for gardening. Here's Dave Ledoux. Hello, gardeners. What's the hottest trend in gardening today? I think it's aquaponics. Can you really grow a massive garden powered by fish poo? Find out more and discover the secrets to building fish-powered gardens at www.backtomygarden.com front slash fish. Attention garden lovers. Do you want to save time, save money, and have your most incredible garden ever? Receive free tips, strategies, and gardening techniques from passionate gardeners around the world. Join the VIP club for free today at www.backtomygarden.com front slash VIP. Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world when we listen to this. I'm Dave Ledoux. And welcome to another edition of Back to My Garden. Spectacular episode today, folks. Our guest, Heather, she loves helping people to rediscover and remember their connection to nature and the earth. She helps design personal garden environments and wonderful spaces for her clients. It starts with a powerful question. How would you describe your dream garden? Heather joins us from one of the most challenging climates in Central Texas. Please welcome from Austin, Texas, Heather McLean. Hi, Heather. Welcome to the show. Hi, Dave. Thank you for having me. I'm glad you're here. I gave you a brief introduction. I want to get to know you a little better, and our guests, or our listeners want to hear your stories, and they're all over the world. So, Heather, take a minute or two, uh, relax, share with us a little bit about your background, and how did you get into gardening? Okay. Well, I think, like many, I've been gardening my whole life. Uh, as a child, I was completely fascinated with packs of seeds. Uh, a lot of kids begged for candy, but I was just amazed at the idea that uh, an entire watermelon could come out of one little package, which, of course, for a small child, you know, I didn't know the method or what was going to be necessary to make the watermelon come out of the package, but I was really interested in gardening and uh tried some attempts at my suburban home as a child, but it wasn't until I was an adult and uh, had uh, some property where I could put some time and effort into it that I started to become more successful. I had moved from Virginia to Atlanta, Georgia, and there's really wonderful climate and soil in Atlanta, so that was a great place to uh, produce a prolific garden. And then I guess my first professional uh, stint in landscaping uh, came when I wanted to do some work with a historic garden. I've always had an interest in history and in art also. And so uh, there is the the Roswell Hall in, in uh, Bullock Hall in Roswell, Georgia. And I was a, uh, a docent and a volunteer there working in the gardens to restore them to their historical uh, appropriateness. And that was fascinating. And so then I moved to Austin, Texas, which is a fantastic place to garden, but it is challenging. Uh, the last several years, I've been here now almost 20 years, and uh, I guess back in 2008, we officially dropped into extreme drought, which is only interrupted by incredible deluge, and uh, all the water uh, is hard to come by because we have very rocky, cliche soil, and when we do have a lot of rain, it tends to run off, and you know we have to come up with strategies for capturing it. Uh, and I design personal and business, and you know some larger gardens for clients, trying to keep all of that in mind, hoping them to be successful. And uh, it's a great pleasure because you know it's always something different, always a new, a new uh, challenge, a new opportunity. And so that's pretty much what I do. Fantastic. Uh, dear listener, I will have all of Heather's links up on the blog at Back to My Garden. You can follow Heather on Twitter at one Heather McLean. That's the number one, H-E-A-T-H-E-R-M-C-C-L-E-A-N. Heather has two great websites. One is www.goodnessgrowsinaustin.com and uh, then one Heather Uh Maybe we'll start on a, a project you're working on. I understand you're writing a book. 
I am. I am. Uh, it, it became apparent to me about a year ago that uh, I had a lot of interesting experiences and stories with other gardeners and that we seem to have a different perspective uh, on life, that gardening mirrors a lot of the challenges in life and that gardeners are ever optimistic. And my book is called The Seventh Season, Wisdom from the Garden of Life. And it's truly about this continuum that we experience in nature as gardeners, that we don't just see four seasons where maybe, you know, if you looked at seasons in terms of your life, you think, oh, in the spring, I'm you know, young and growing. And then the summer is, you know, sort of the the fertile time of our lives. And, and then comes a harvest if we're fortunate. And then winter comes and we're sort of older and declining and then it's all over. And gardeners don't really see it that way. There's much more to it than that. And we see uh, always, you know, winters as a time that will then lead to another, another season. So uh, the seventh season is really about coming into alignment with the seasons and, and, and the rhythms of nature, much like many gardeners experience. I'm still here. It's just my mind is blown. Your mind is blown. <laughs> well, it's really it's the the interesting thing about it to me is that everyone has a story for me. Once I sort of hit upon this, um, I've included just so many great uh, analogies for life that when you start start thinking about it, it's really true. Um, for example, the the first season is the the winter of discontent, and that is nature's way of clearing space for something new to grow. So we all know as gardeners, you know, you get to a certain point, like here in Austin, we had a great long, but our fall season goes late, 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 like all the way to November. And we still had tomatoes and peppers. and But you have to start to prepare for the winter garden if you want to have, you know, uh, I love to grow food and I love greens that I can grow through the winter. So I knew that, you know, I was going to have to go out and clear that space. And so as gardeners, we can accept that, that we're going to have to make changes, big changes, and go forward with appreciation. You know, this is a great summer garden. Now I'm looking forward to this new winter garden. Uh, but in life, you know, it's not always as easy for us to see those big changes with appreciation or even look forward, you know. So, uh, I think it's a really interesting analogy that when life dishes up these sudden changes for you, um, that you can think about it in terms of a garden. Wow. You had mentioned the inherent optimism of the gardener. And that's what got me thinking is it's virtually impossible to be a gardener if you stick a seed in the ground and say, oh, that'll probably never grow. Absolutely right. I mean, and that's that. That's the that's a, the nature of a gardener is to be not only optimistic but also envisioning the the, the largest best potential possible. Because you know, we plant that seed with the dream of the full fruitage. We really do. You know, we we see it that way. And then the other thing that's interesting is time and time again, gardeners are not disappointed people. If things don't reach that uh, potential that they saw initially, we take it as a lesson. And we think, hmm, maybe I could do something different next time, or maybe I'll try another variety. Or We're always planning for another optimistic result. We have listeners now, Heather, in like in 63 or 4 countries. Mm -hmm. And there's listeners right now listening to us saying, well, hurry up and get to the, you know, tell me what to do stage. And then there's others that are really embracing. It's it's almost like energy or philosophy because I'm trying to understand this whole concept of what you do for a living in garden design and landscape creation. Um, it almost, I, I lack the part of the brain to under, to do what you do, um, I always ask garden designers, is it a gift? Is it a muscle? Is it a skill set that can be developed? I ask the same sort of questions of people who like to paint or write music. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That's how I look at what you do. I, I look with awe and trepidation. Oh, well, thank you for that. But you shouldn't be. Um, 
I think it is a combination of all those things, as is, you know, any uh, art form. And I, I like to think of myself as a gardener rather than a landscaper because um, I, I like to see the garden emerge. And the garden emerges as a, uh, an expression of the individuals who are desiring that, that connection and that beautiful space to have around them. And then I help them identify the need that they have. Some people you know, maybe for their families or their pets or a place for them to relax or meditate. Or I'm very much encouraging everyone to grow some sort of um, edibles in their garden. And I'm extremely oriented toward native plants and appreciation for the particular landscape in whatever part of the country or world that you're in. Because we, we, what I do is I really think I, I teach appreciation of nature. And a lot of people call me, Dave, and they don't really know what they want. They just want something better. Uh, and so a lot of times it takes uh, some calling out, you know, the right questions. What do you want to do here? What, what do you see in the future? You know, what, what is this space going to be like for you? And then I can kind of glean that garden comes through that way. And then it's it's great joy to help see that burst into reality. That's 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 what I do. Educate me as a layman a little bit. I know not all your clients. You can't lump them into the same group. But do you ever have clients come to you? They've inherited somebody else's mess, and they come to you either frustrated or almost despondent, like on the verge of giving up. Oh sure. Oh, sure. Yeah. And um, one of the things, this just, we just had a, a big garden show here uh, last weekend, and I got to talk to hundreds of people about their gardens. It was really fun. And um, one of the, the, either someone buys a home, an existing home that has a landscape or garden around it, and they don't know what to make of it, or sometimes they've bought and built a home. And uh, I asked one gentleman about, you know, well, what did the builder give you? And he said, well, just a lot of stress, which I thought was really funny. And, you know, so there is a starting place, whether it's from I don't like what I see all around me or I've got nothing and I want something new. Um, Again, I go back to that process every gardener uses is you've got to, you know, I like form to follow function. What do you want to do here? You know, understanding what the space needs to be like. And there certainly are tools that, that landscape designers use. Um, I think one of the, this might be helpful to your listeners, one of the, the big mistakes a lot of people make in designing gardens is they become infatuated with color and they forget to put evergreen structures, you know, the bones of the garden, the stability of the garden season after season into the design. So my personal practice is to look at that first, look at the hardscape, look at areas where you'll, um, you know, have seating areas or walkways, and then then look at how do I add, like, structures to that room through the form of, of you know, hardwood trees and evergreens, and then work my way back to the color in the garden because all of the, the foliage and textures really need to form up the garden year-round, and then this, the color is the exciting part that comes and goes kind of like, uh, a symphony. Mm. Heather, you're in Austin, Texas, which is one of the most amazing cities to live in North America. I've been explaining to my European gardening friends how brutal your drought is and how challenging it is for somebody, a garden designer like yourself. Can you comment a little bit about how you've evolved as, as a designer and some of the challenges and how you've met them? Well, I have one input that I think is really important as it's really shifted my perception of what a landscape uh, should be. I think for a long time, we as designers and individuals crowded a great deal of plant material into small spaces, hoping for instant gratification. But because of the extreme drought, I've really learned to put all of my hope in creating um, a good amount of soil and space for the root systems of plants to take up whatever moisture and nutrients are available uh, and then whatever supplemental water we can give them. So fewer plants that are allowed to grow to their mature size are definitely the new paradigm to move forward to. The days of, you know, 
trying to shove a whole lot of small plants into a space, hoping it'll immediately fill the area. The root systems just begin to, you know, decline. They can't, they can't get enough moisture or nutrients that way. So I think that's been one of the number one things for me. And it's, it's quite shocking to people if, uh, you know, they're not accustomed to it, but we've had great results where within one year to three years, the, the plants take off and really grow, Dave, a lot, you know, because they've been given that space to thrive rather than trying to compress them all into a tight area. I think that's a huge thing. You mentioned how stress is often the starting point for your clients. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess designing, not everybody wants a, a, a high-maintenance garden, do they? No, and I go on the assumption that, that they will put very little maintenance into it. I think that uh, the best that we can offer right now is um, very sustainable landscapes that require small amounts of maintenance and then include spaces where you do have the opportunity for someone to putter around, whether it's with their edibles or whether it's with flowers um, or herbs, the things that they want. Um, I think that it's imperative that we use native plants and well-adapted plants that can pretty much tough it out on their own because we've looked at in the last several years, you know, not just extreme watering conditions or restrictions and, you know, lack of rain, but also extremely high temperatures, not just in the day, but throughout the night. So the plants never really get a chance to recover. Uh, so it's, it's been really a different, different way. So, so, you know, the native plants that are well adapted to this area and this type of climate are the order of the day for sure. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of listeners, Heather, that live in urban centers. A lot of people that listen to the show have patios or maybe balconies. Um, can you share a little bit of your bag of tricks as a designer? Um, when you're working with an intimate space, what are your, some of your favorite tips or starting points when designing in really small spaces? Oh, I love this question. Um, well, again, I think that looking for one element that can be a focal point, something that's, uh, depending on the size, a very small balcony, that one focal point might be, let's say, uh, a container lemon tree or... Uh, a, a jasmine. I love Sampak jasmine because it's got that luscious fragrance to it. Or a rosemary. Uh, something that can be a, a beautiful focal point. And then I always think that it's really great to incorporate uh, if, if possible you know, some sort of ornamental artistic element too. I love small water features or small wind chimes or a finch feeder, something decorative that gives some activity to the garden as well. So I really think you can build a beautiful garden with as little as three components. Um, but again, I look to the structural things first, and then the third component would be the color. And the color often is something seasonal uh, where you can change, you know, in, in the summer, depending on what part of the world you live in, live in you know, you may want you know, a blooming flowering plant. And in the winter, you may want something that you know is going to stay evergreen and uh, have maybe a foliage fragrance or something. So I think you can do uh, a wonderful balcony space. I think it's, it's, uh, it's nice if you can incorporate somewhere to sit and enjoy it. That's great, too. Um, small little table and chair where you can sit and enjoy your cup of tea. I think it's great. You really need that, don't you, in the city? Like the constant stress from traffic and noise and uh, compressed living. Uh, I was thinking of the think Japanese, you know. I think it's essential. Yeah, nice, nice. Now, you're working with clients, you're writing a book, you're busier than all get out. Did you get a chance to garden yourself last season? Oh, absolutely. I, I make it a point. It's, it's part of my spiritual practice, Dave, to go out there every morning. So uh, I, I really enjoy thinking about encouraging others as well to just, you know, get some fresh air, even in the cold, cold temperature of the winter or the brutal heat of the summer. The freshness of the morning is the best to me to come out and just take a look. And so, yes, I'm, I garden in every season. I, I truly do. Now, the listeners, without being nosy, I'm their conduit. Um, what brought you joy this year in your garden and did anything frustrate or surprise you? 
Uh, well, I always I have my vegetable garden in my front yard because uh, that's where I have the most sun for it. And so I always like to plant something surprising. I've done artichokes and Brussels sprouts and the neighborhood children all thought those were great. Well, this year I did some purple peppers that they all found quite entertaining. I believe the variety was Purple Beauty. And uh, they were just, you know, I think it's Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers, but we did it Purple Peppers, and it was pretty fun. And then frustration, uh, well, just with the extreme heat and drought, my tomatoes, um, they did much better in the fall. In the summer, they didn't do as well. Um, but... Uh, as far as the, 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 the native plants in my flowering garden, um, my Texas mountain laurel were amazing last year with the blossoms. Are you familiar, familiar Dave? It's got a, a, a purple blossom. It's Sephora Secundiflora, and it's got a great bubblegum fragrance. They're fabulous, and they were great. I'm going to link to the Latin on Wikipedia from the blog because I'm trying to pick it up as I go. I find Latin extremely challenging. I do too, and I only mention that one because there is a sister um, plant with mountain laurel that they easily, listeners, would confuse. So the Sephora is the truly native, evergreen, sort of small tree that grows here. Um, but the, the other mountain laurel is more like a shrub. So that's the only problem with common names, and I, I'm, I mostly use common names myself and debate the pronunciation of many of the Latin names I probably don't do the best job sometimes so but that one in particular that that tree was just outstanding with the drought and the heat and everything it just thrived here and did wonderfully last year that falls perfectly into the surprise category anything right. that does well in 95 degree heat that's amazing Oh, we're talking 117 on some days. <laughs> yeah. I mean, oh, we but... were, 95 was a good day. <laughs> it's a dry heat. No, it's not. <laughs> right, right. Oh, my right. goodness. Now, for the Celsius listeners out there, 117 is in your low 40s. Think like India in the summer. It's not as not as moist, but still, my goodness. Well, we have those strings of 100-degree days, and, you know, with my, my crews and when we're, we're working, we start work very early, but, you know, it inhibits us working late into the day because I certainly don't want anyone to get, you know, sick or injured, and um, we didn't have too many that were that hot this year. Um, 2011 was, was really brutal, um, and 2012 was a little better. Um, so it's been, it's been, like I said, just a, a way of life. It's just a different change the way things are here now. Let's take a quick minute to thank our sponsors and then come back and play five quick questions. Are you concerned about toxic chemicals, GMOs, and frankenfood? Don't panic. Grow organic. Discover my new resource for organic gardeners. Go to www.backtomygarden.com front slash myorganic. It's finally here. 99 remarkably clever gardening ideas that you can steal immediately. It's a free report. You get instant access. It's an epic list of tips, hacks, and gardening shortcuts just for you. Go to backtomygarden.com front slash clever. You know, Heather, I glanced at the clock and our time is flying by. And now is the time in the show where we play a game called Five Quick Questions. Oh, Okay. This is your chance to share your wisdom and experience with novice rookie gardeners. Are you ready to play? Of course. Question number one. What is the funniest or silliest gardening mistake that you've ever made that you're willing to admit to publicly? Oh, wow. I guess uh, planting ornamental artichokes, hoping for food, and getting fabulous flowers but no food. Um, that was not... Real well researched. <laughs> That's a good one. That qualifies. Excellent. Uh, question two. You've been at this now, did you say 19 years? Yes. What is a skill or a unique talent that you possess that is either very useful or a time saver for you in your line of work? Mm, very useful or time saving. Uh... 
I want to say optimism, <laughs> but I don't know if that's, the, that's really a tool. I think if you're talking about like literal tools, um, one of my, are you talking about like a hand tool or a garden tool? Uh, well, I was going to say a personal skill or talent, but uh, you could do a garden tool. Oh, well, um, I love my Falco clippers, especially the ergonomic ones that help my hands a great deal. And uh, I love my uh, adjustable rake that I can contour the whip in and out. Um, and a really good pair of mud boots is also essential. Off topic here. Uh, a century ago, especially like in England, garden design and landscaping was predominantly a male-dominated line of work. Uh, is it balanced now, 50-50? Oh, definitely not. I think it's still fairly male-dominated, but there are many women uh, who are in this profession, but I'd, I'd still say it's still uh, a smaller number of women than men. The reason I bring it up, I get emails. I have a lot of parents that listen to this show with uh, right. young teenagers. Right. And you know how North America now, you go into crazy debt to get a degree from a university, and then you probably can't find a job. And we've kind of been evangelizing horticulture as a career path. And for women, if it's viable, and I, I you know, I'm of the camp that it's extremely viable for ladies to do professional horticulture? I think it's extremely viable uh, to do professional horticulture with or without a degree. I think it's one of those disciplines where uh, apprenticeship or internship is really valuable, where you can, as a, a teenager or a young adult, you can try it out and see if you like it and then gain more education through, say, like the extension services like the master gardener programs. There are a lot of ways that you could, you know, enhance your ability to have a career in this industry without a traditional degree. And uh, I came to it in, by way of my art history background and uh, did some historical garden restoration, as I mentioned. And uh, I think you, there are a lot of ways into this industry for sure. Oh, I love it. Great tips. Internship. You know, 200 years ago, that's how people became, you know, weavers and fletchers and coopers. And every profession, you started at the bottom and studied under a master. Well, you also learn if you like it. I think the most important thing is finding a profession that, you know, if you love what you do, then your work is, is your love. You know, it, it's, it's, it's a gift to the world. And so, you know, spending many years studying something but not really being sure if that's what you love to do, I think is kind of a danger. So mm -hmm. I think apprenticeship is essential. As I usually do, I got off my five quick questions outline, but that's a, uh -oh. a good tangent. <laughs> uh, question three. Everyone, of course, should go to your website at www.goodnessgrowsinaustin.com. That's a fabulous one. Well done. Um, Thank you. Do you have one or two favorite websites for resources that you can recommend to new gardeners? Oh, I sure do. Uh, I, if we're uh, interested in uh, native plants, not just in my region, but all around North America, the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center here is, I believe, wildflower.org is their website. And there is an incredible database where you can put in your um, climate zone, and you can select plants based on their size, color, habit. It's a wonderful database, uh, the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center here in Austin. And then another one of my favorites for organic gardening is the Natural Gardener, uh, which is John Drumgold's business here. I think he has the oldest organic gardening radio show in the country. Uh, and it's got video and tips and recipes and uh, a calendar for planting and it's a really helpful website wonderful now on the opposite side of the coin uh, old school do you have a favorite gardening book that you can suggest uh, well you know i i really like i i like inspiring garden books i mean one of my all-time very favorite is called monet's garden by vivian russell and it's a collection of Monet's um, work 
artwork along with photographs of the actual gardens, and then it even includes, you know, things about stories about the gardens, how uh, plans for the gardens. Um, it's really inspiring to me to just look through that from time to time. Uh, and then I also really, really like, um, there's a book that I've had for years called Visions of Paradise um, by Marina Shin, and it's just beautiful with themes and variations, different styles, the Italian style, English style. And so both of those books, often if I, I need some inspiration, those are books I go to. Oh, wonderful. I'll have links up on the blog at Back to My Garden for all of those books and websites. Uh, question five is a fun one, Heather. No right or wrong answer. Okay. Is there anything you've never grown that you're just itching to experiment with? Hmm. Well, I am going to try white eggplant this year. Um, I I look at the uh, Monticello has heirloom seeds from the Jefferson Garden. And there's a, a, a ghost eggplant, a little white eggplant, which I think I'm going to try out this year. Okay, I just started taking notes and I messed up. Ghost eggplant, you got my interest. Monticello. Well, the Jefferson's you... Garden in uh, Virginia is a functioning historical garden. And uh, they have heirloom seeds that you can go to their website and you can order seed from the, the ancestors of plants. And, you know, he was the ambassador to France, so some of his... Uh, Plants and foodstuffs go all the way back to that time period, and they've been saving seed and reproducing, and um, it's, it's an amazing garden. I've visited it many times. It's wonderful. Man, that's the tip of the week for me. I, <laughs> I wrote it in oh, giant Oh, the Monticello oh, yeah. Garden? Oh, you need to look at their website, Dave. You'll love it. It's really great. And there, there are many books. He kept many garden journals. Um, a lot of the, the garden practices that we have in the country, I think we could trace way back to him. Wow. I'm all about the heirloom seeds. Like, we grew 23 kinds of heirloom tomatoes last year. Oh, well, he's got a bunch, and oh, lettuce, fantastic. and peppers, and all kinds of things. So Nice. Ghost eggplant. Wow, wow, wow. Mm -hmm. I thought for a second you were going to say ghost pepper. <laughs> kind of. Well, I've grown the fairy tale eggplant, and that was kind of fun, but I thought the a little white ghost eggplant would be fun, too. I'm growing, um, it's a Taiwanese eggplant called a ping tung. Oh. It's long, uh, about the length of your uh, elbow to your fingertip. Wow. Yeah, very unusual. And you kind of slice them thin and fry them on the barbecue. Or oh, put them in ratatouille. There you go. Sounds yeah. good. Nice. Oh, my goodness, I'm... I can't believe our time is nearly over. <laughs> oh, um, listeners, I told you this would be a good episode. I want you to follow Heather on Twitter at the number one Heather McLean. Check her out online at www.goodnessgrowsinaustin.com and at oneheathermcclain.com. Watch for Heather's book. Uh, do you have a timeline on your book release next year? I'm hoping this year, um, if it's not by the end of 2015, it'll be early 2016, mm -hmm. so... You're going to go through we do have We do have a, uh, um, on the websites, you can click to subscribe and get updates. Uh, and then on the oneheathermcclain.com, I put up uh, a blog with bits from the book. So it's kind of a little taste of what's to come. Oh, fabulous. If you're in the Austin area and you're looking for a sensational garden designer, reach out to Heather. And uh, Heather, you've been just a brilliant guest on... Um, Time has flown by. I'm kind of flummoxed here. Uh, oh, thank you. I want to give you the last word to the listeners. They're all over the world, every climate zone, every kind of garden. Can you leave us with a note of encouragement or a pearl of wisdom? Oh, this is something I tell a lot of my clients, and I think you can use it in your garden or you can use it in your life. And uh, I, I think that it's very appropriate with some of the things going on in the world right now. So I, I would say to everyone, an empty space is just a place waiting to become. Absolutely brilliant. Heather, you've been fantastic. Thanks for being on the show. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you.